Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us for another Hand Surgery Essentials uh, series. This is covering phalangeal fractures. Thanks to everyone that's tuning in live or um, will be watching down the road. We have a great faculty with us tonight. We have Dr. Cha Wu from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, we have Marco, Dr. Marco Rizzo, who I'm not sure if he's on here quite yet, um, but he's one of my partners at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, Dr. Rebecca Nideski from El Elon uh, University. And then I will um, also give uh, some um, perspective as well. My name is Peter Reed. Here are the disclosures. And for just, I think everyone is familiar with Zoom etiquette by now, but just turn your microphones on mute. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the uh, didactic portion of the case discussion, please use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen and we'll have our moderators and uh, our faculty answering as, um, as we go. And I should mention, there's also a lot of faculty on tonight too. So we have plenty of people to answer questions. Uh, here are the learning objectives. Uh, really, by the end of this session, we'd want you just to understand the major types of phalangeal fractures and know how to manage them, whether they're operatively or non-operatively, and then um, just be prepared and anticipate for any complications that may arise with treatment of these phalangeal fractures. So I'll pass it off to Dr. Wu at this point to go on with the didactic session. Cha? Thanks, Peter. So uh, today I'm charged with the task of talking about phalangeal fractures, uh, which is a huge topic. So I'll try to provide a broad overview and um, talk about some general principle, treatment principles. And um, we'll try to cover this uh, from distal to middle to proximal, as well as the different flavors that's involved in the distal, middle, and uh, proximal fract phalanx fractures as well. We'll try to co provide a comprehensive overview. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, saying a quote that um, despite the, um, it's not advancing. Oh, there we go. Uh, by providing a quote that despite was uttered about 50 years ago, um, it's as relevant as ever. So Dr. Swanson said in 1970 that the hand fracture can be complicated by deformity from no treatment, stiffness from overtreatment, and both deformity and stiffness from poor treatment. Uh, it's really quite a salient quote that despite being so long, I think this still rings uh, very much true today. In addition, it's not just hand fractures. I think this is especially true for phalangeal fractures. Um, in other body parts of the body, sometimes you can stave off certain complications by overfixation, but in the finger in particular, um, you know, that is not necessarily a good strategy. The surgeon should always try to balance stability and uh, stiffness with your choice of incision and choice of hardware. So we'll begin by talking about general principles in anatomy. So um, finger fracture is um, the most common uh, fracture in the uh, musculoskeletal system, and specifically the distal phalanx uh, being the most common. Uh, some is estimated to be over 600,000 per year, which is quite a lot. It's uh, commonly seen in you know, all sorts of patients, namely from the athletic patient, uh, occupational injuries, um, or really in anybody. Although the tendency is the young, the young patient tend to be sports related. Um, in the working age, people, of course, is you know, work related. And the elderly, it can be accidental trauma, such as from fall and other things. To perform a comprehensive evaluation, of course, you want to uh, start by taking the history. Age could be relevant because it could tell you as far as their healing potential. Uh, their expected level of function is this a grandma that lives in the nursing home that just uh, needs to uh, be able to feed herself, or is this an elite level athlete uh, that needs to be performed at a high level? Then, you know, that has further implications also, whether it's a racket sport, handedness, of course, occupation we already talked about. Timing is also important because um, you want to know if this is an, a truly an acute injury, is it an acute and chronic, or is it a chronic injury? Mechanism of injury could be crushing, could be sharp, could be blunt. History of previous injury could inform you perhaps there is a chronic component and there could be a secondary deformities from a previous injury that's superimposed on top of the injury patient came to see you today for. There's also history of previous treatment. Is this something that was previously operated on by another surgeon? 
uh, that potentially you need to worry about infection or non-union. And lastly, of course, expectation, depending on what the patient had a realistic expectation or not, and between the level of function you can expect your surgery is able to achieve for them, is also an important part of the decision making. In terms of the physical exam, always start by examining the patient with inspection, looking at any soft tissue trauma. Is there a subungoid hematoma? Is there injury to the germinal matrix? Get a careful vascular exam. Is there a good cap refill? Uh, if indicated, perhaps even perform a Doppler to make sure that the tip is uh, well vascularized. Neuro exam, of course, uh, two-point discrimination is very important to make sure that your nerves are intact, especially for any sharp injuries where you're worried the nerves might be out. Flex and extensor tendon dysfunction um, is also important because uh, your incisions are going to have to be designed around these vital structures, and you know maintaining soft tissue integrity is also an important part of restoring function. And of course, we do not want to forget collateral ligament uh, stability, especially for blunt injuries. They could be part of the equation, and. Um, most importantly, of course, looking at cascade, especially uh, critical for finger fractures. So on the picture you can see here on the left hand is, uh, this is what I typically do in clinic when I ask patients to make a fist for me and compare the injured hand against the uninjured hand. On the left hand side, you can see a normal cascade. And on the right hand side, you can see a male rotation. Uh, if you don't do this, sometimes it can be easily missed because when the patient has their finger extended, uh, laying flat on the table, with the palm facing down, it actually can be quite difficult to tell whether the patient has male rotation or not. And then of course, uh, I always, uh, for phalanx fractures, it's ideally best to be able to get three views of the finger rather than the hand x-ray. Uh, you can get better resolution and you can also be able to tell the fracture pattern. But in addition, uh, you can be able to tell the bone quality if there's any lesions, perhaps the pathologic fractures. In general, though, the transverse uh, fracture patterns tend to angulate, and we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of deforming forces. Spiral fractures tend to rotate, which sometimes can be easily missed on uh, x-ray, and that usually requires an exam for you to ascertain whether there was male rotation. And the comminuted fracture tend to shorten, and uh, that could be have implications as far as being able to extend the finger, especially the PIP joint, if there is a shortening where the flex and the extensive forces are imbalanced. The treatment, especially for the extra articular ones in general is uh, based on alignment and early movement. And what I mean by that is you want to check their alignment in the sagittal plane, in the coronal plane, in the rotational plane, and all of your treatment is based on restoring that. And that in part will depend on the fracture pattern, whether you think it's stable, uh, your fixation strategy should keep that in mind. Early movement, uh, it's always important in the finger to prevent stiffness, but you have to make sure you design your surgical fixation in a way that allows for early movement uh, with enough stability. Similarly, your surgical approach will have to be uh, about minimizing soft tissue trauma so they don't get too much post-op swelling and pain that limits their ability to move post-operatively. So we'll go through these one by one. I'll start by doing the distal phalanx fracture and the different flavors of distal phalanx fracture and then middle and then proximal. Tough fracture typically is presented you know, in the emergency room where the patient comes in complaining there's some sort of crush injury, uh, whether that be jammed in the door uh, or some sort of uh, heavy object has hit their hand. And they typically present with um, uh, fracture that sometimes can be seemingly a little bit subtle on plain film. As you can see right here, um, you can definitely see the fracture line, but uh, um, you uh, want to make sure uh, that those are best detected when they are uh, get on the finger views rather than the hand views. And you also want to evaluate for soft tissue trauma. The, these type of injuries are commonly associated with nail bed injuries and sub hematoma that frequently will require removal of the uh, nail and um, repair of the uh, nail bed injury. And of course, if there's any injury to the nail fold, you want to uh, place the nail back to stand the nail fold open so you don't get any nail deformities because this, if the nail fold uh, heals to the underlying uh, nail bed, sometimes uh, that could prevent the new nail from growing out and result in the, uh, result in the um, split nail deformity, which is why you can see here on the right-hand side of this picture on the left-hand side, you see 
um, uh, a uh, injury, um, it, it's in the toe, but it's the same idea uh, where you have a nail bed injury that sometimes can be open. If there's any concern for contamination, you can consider placing uh, the patient in uh, on PO antibiotics, and if there's an instability, consider pinning. Now, moving on to uh, the malar finger. The malar finger typically, uh, most commonly, is a tenderness injury where a patient comes in uh, complaining, mm -hmm. oftentimes a uh, sports-related injury where their finger got hit by a ball, and they're complaining of a lazy finger that's droopy. But don't be fooled by that. I, uh, for these type of injuries, I will always make sure I get an x-ray because there could be a bony component to it. And uh, as you can see right here in this picture, uh, the left hand most uh, picture that shows a quote unquote droopy finger is a purely tenderness flavor of this fracture of this uh, injury. And then uh, in the second picture from the left side and the third, you can actually see uh, there's a fracture on the dorsal aspect. It's almost like an avulsion type fracture. And then the third picture over from the left-hand side, you can actually see the joint is incongruent. That's an indication for surgery. So if you actually draw a line uh, through the middle phalanx and through the distal phalanx, you can see these two red lines uh, are not lined up. And uh, that usually will require some sort of pinning uh, to restore the congruency of the joint, which is the most important for preventing function. But if uh, such a surgical indication is not open, these patients typically can be treated with the splint that you can see on the lower right-hand side uh, for eight weeks full-time and then gradually wean the splint after. And uh, these patients also can frequently have soft tissue irritation on the dorsum. So that's also something to monitor when you see these patients. And lastly, if, um, if these injuries goes untreated, uh, they can actually uh, develop uh, swan necking uh, which is a secondary deformity uh, from this type of issue. And the swan neck, again, you can see here on the uh, rightmost picture, uh, usually is a result of attenuation of the volar plate in the transverse retinacular ligament. And uh, this will ultimately lead to the dorsal subluxation of the lateral bands, and uh, which result in the picture that you see here, which is a PIP hyperextension and um, PIP flexion. If it's chronic enough, eventually, uh, the triangular ligament will be contracted too. So on the left-hand side, you can actually see in the middle panel right here is one of the most common ways to fix the bony malar, which is you start by using the K-wire uh, pre as a, almost as a backstop to uh, prevent that dorsal piece from displacing further. And then you lift the finger into extension and pin it. And you can see the leftmost picture right here uh, that the joint congruency has been restored. Now we're moving on to Jersey finger. So Jersey finger, similar to the malar finger, frequently is uh, thought of as a tenderness injury. The most common flavor way people uh, present with this issue is uh, it's a somebody who uh, has uh, their FDP fully engaged, such as a football player who's trying to tackle another player, but the VIP is forcefully hyperextended, uh, a eccentric pull, if you will, and that could cause uh, the rupture of the tendon and uh, inability to flex the DIP. But that doesn't mean they couldn't be associated with a bony component. So always make sure that uh, you get x-rays to roll it out. And um, this is an example, a case that I did recently where you can actually see the, in the distal phalanx, uh, the FTP pulled off a piece of bone with it. And then this, in this specific case, it was treated with uh, ORIF where, um, that piece of uh, uh, bone was uh, uh, fixated back to the distal phalanx. Uh, a consideration for this is that uh, if the screw is long, potentially it could cause uh, nail deformity. So you wanna make sure your screw is not long if you can help it. And also uh, there could potentially could be a fracture line through the dorsal cortex. So that's, uh, that's not true with this case, but that's also something to consider fixing these type of fractures. Um, and the, the right hand most, picture you can see right here is a classic jersey finger where there's inability to flex the DIP, a clinical photo. This is typically classified with the Letty Packer classification. As we discussed, there can be a, a tenderness component, a bony component, but sometimes you can actually get um, what they call a double avulsion. Not only do you get a bony component, you also get a tendon uh, 
avulsion off of the bony component. So the surgeon should always be prepared, make sure you get a careful exam, be prepared to uh, address both uh, pathology. Luckily, if these are caught acutely, as you can see in the right-hand picture here, there's a vincular system on the flexor side. So what that means is if these are caught acutely, they typically don't retract too far. And oftentimes you can actually palpate the tendon stump but just with a good physical exam to see the level of retraction. But if there's any question, you can always consider an ultrasound. And uh, certainly the chronic ones that come in presenting leg can retract all the way to the palm. And those are usually more difficult uh, to fix as uh, by then the tendon has already contracted and is, um, is short. Next, we'll move on to uh, the middle phalanx fracture. And uh, the first flavor is a dorsal fracture dislocation. And then we're gonna talk about volar and then eventually the pilon, which is sort of a combination of fracture, if you will, of, um, of both. The typical story with a patient with this flavor is usually somebody who uh, has their palm open. So a, a patient that I actually saw today is somebody who was playing basketball, was trying to catch a pass from somebody else, but wasn't paying attention and the ball grazed the hand as he was trying to catch it. It's a hyperextension force um, that can cause this type of injury. As far as some general principles regarding the middle phalanx fracture, um, you can see a picture right here. Uh, the, the forming forces really depends on the level of the fracture. You know, if the fracture is um, proximal to the insertion um, of the FDS, it tends to be apex dorsal. As you can see in this photo right here, the central slip is pu uh, pu pulling the fracture, the proximal fragment up. Whereas if the uh, fracture is distal to the FDS insertion, it tends to be apex volar. Um, just like, um, and in this case, the FDS overpowers the central slip, uh, just like this, um, this uh, picture uh, suggests. In terms of the non-operative criteria in these type of fractures, I'm always worried about checking for a normal cascade to make sure there's no male rotation. And then you also don't want to worry about, um, especially the extra, uh, extra articular variant, there is uh, uh, not a significant amount of angulation or shortening because these can all lead to imbalance of the flexor and extensor forces, and that could cause contractures and secondary deformities. And then of course, the surgical indication is any unstable fracture pattern, or if there's any uh, failure of the above criteria. It's also important to know uh, these, uh, reco the recovery of these type of fractures is also um, associated with, uh, as far as restoring their motion, is associated with age. So studies have shown that you know, in young patients, typically in the first two decades, you can regain often up to 80% of motion, whereas the prognosis is less favorable in the older population. Patients in their sixth or seventh decades of life, uh, oftentimes the uh, regain in the total range of motion can be 60% or less. So it could help you uh, as far as guiding uh, that pre-op discussion with the patient about expectation of outcome. So similar to some of the things we discussed, the dorsal dislocation uh, can be a, a non-fracture variant, purely soft tissue. And these you can typically, as you can see in the leftmost picture here, reduce with a little bit of traction and volarly directed force. Sometimes a little bit of hyperextension can help you reduce uh, these type of fractures. But it's also important to know, as you can see in the middle picture and the rightmost picture right here, that even though the joint looks reduced, something is quite off. And uh, you can see, even though the joint is quote unquote reduced, it's um, uh, almost like the, um, uh, that the, uh, the middle phalanx is almost a touch volarly subluxated. And you can see on the PA right here, there is almost an asymmetric gapping between the medial and lateral aspect of the, the distance between the middle phalanx and the condyle. And sometimes these can present a subtle, but definitely real or rotational deformities from the condyles of punching through the capsule. So these could be important as far as um, uh, understanding that these reductions are not uh, where they should be, uh, can be quite subtle like this and uh, may require open, uh, open reduction in order to get it properly done. Another commonly uh, concerning aspect is there could also be interposition of the volar plate and that uh, 
oftentimes you will not be able to achieve a good reduction with uh, closed methods. You will probably have to go to the OR um, in order to get that uh, done properly. As far as the fracture pattern, the way we typically think about this is in terms of restoring joint congruency and stability. And uh, the studies have shown the common number that's quoted is about 50% of the articular surface involvement or higher uh, is unstable. And uh, you can see right here, there's a 15% that's stable, 30% is tenuous and 50% is unstable. And I think it's important to talk about, even though we use this rule of thumb, at the end of the point, it's about whether the joint is congruent. I typically will take these patients for a office fluoroscopic exam to see if there's any hinging. And what do I mean by hinge? It's um, usually what we look for when we determine whether there's hinging uh, or not through motion is what we call the V sign, which is the middle picture right here. And you can see the V right here that's formed by the condyle of the proximal phalanx and uh, in the middle phalanx. And the typical thing about hinging is that if, um, if there is um, hinging at the fracture site, uh, as you attempt to flex the fingers, uh, the V will actually become exaggerated. And that's a surgical indication. That means you won't have full range of motion unless you do something to restore that. In the acute setting, if at all possible, I try to open these and fix these because the patient's native bone is the best. Um, but uh, sometimes it's not possible. And we're gonna talk about the different treatment options, especially if these are um, chronic or acute on chronic even in some cases. So this is a busy slide, but I'll you know, take it through one by one from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So most commonly uh, uh, you can use a dorsal blocking pin, as you can see on the right, uh, left-hand side here, um, this uh, will allow uh, the joint to remain congruent and begin uh, some motion uh, to prevent the hinging at the fracture site. And uh, pro more popular historically, uh, the middle panel, uh, upper picture is what we call a volar plate arthroplasty, where you can actually uh, in incise our uh, volar plate and uh, fix it to, uh, into the defect. And that uh, will help uh, restore the congruency. And then of course, there's also an option in the middle panel, lower picture, you can see that's a dynamic external fixator. Uh, although in my brief experience, I think these are tend to be poorly tolerated by patients, especially for non-border digits, although it's certainly an option uh, for fixation. Uh, they, uh, patients tend to complain they jam into the other fingers. And also uh, it's technically quite demanding because the wires in the proximal and the distal um, aspect has to be perfectly parallel. Otherwise you're introducing, you're introducing another deforming force. And then lastly, uh, recently that's been uh, more in vogue as popularized by Dr. Hastings. On the right-hand panel is what we call the hemi heme, where you actually harvest a graph of the dorsal surface of the hemi, as you can see right here in the fourth and fifth CMC. And then basically you transplant uh, that piece of bone into restoring uh, the congruency of the joint, a bone graft. So it's almost like a ladder J of the finger to restore that concavity uh, to allow for um, a proper movement of the PIP joint. Now there's also the volar uh, dorsal uh, fracture, uh, sorry, the volar fracture dislocation, which is the opposite of the dorsal. These uh, typically can start off uh, with uh, central slip avulsion, sometimes purely tenderness. Sometimes there's a small fracture fragment attached with that. Uh, it kind of depends. And uh, sometimes these can be quite subtle. Um, and uh, the most common story is sometimes patients come in complaining of a jammed finger. And it's usually some sort of axial load while the digit is extended or hyperextended. It's the most common uh, way people describe these type of injuries. As you can see right here on the left hand most panel is a central slip uh, injury with a small bony piece. Uh, if there's no joint subluxation and it's purely tenderness, uh, you can often treat these and the fracture fragment is small. You can often, often treat these with a uh, extension splint and um, to detect these type of injuries, especially the purely tenderness flavor, it's important to do a good Elson's test to make sure there's no injury to the central slip to prevent uh, secondary deformities. Uh, 
uh, and you can leave the, P the, the DIP freeze to allow for flexion. Uh, but if these are missed and goes on to chronic, especially with a large fracture fragment, they can also oftentimes go on to become a roller uh, fracture dislocation. And uh, as a general rule of thumb, you know, typically you're looking at uh, a, a fracture fragment at two millimeters or larger tends to be more unstable. The ones that are smaller or less than two millimeters uh, typically is stable. Although I, um, I think it's a uh, uh, patient and patient basis because uh, obviously we worry about these fracture sizes and patterns, but at the end of the day, there's other soft tissue that provides some stability as well. So this is uh, a, a more obvious flavor of the volar fracture dislocation. And similar to previous injuries that we've talked about, the most important thing here is to restore um, the joint congruity, uh, more so than articular depression. On the right-hand picture, again, you see a, a dorsal fracture right here. And uh, if you plan to fix this uh, with ORIF, especially if the piece is large enough, it's also important to know that um, there's often a component of articular depression, as you can see in this right-hand picture right here, and uh, that you, uh, when you fix it, restore and temp up the articular surface to provide the proper joint surface uh, for a, um, for, um, you know, the proper fixation and uh, make sure that you restore joint congruity. Um, some people will also choose to treat some of these uh, injuries with our, uh, transarticular pinning although I try to avoid that whenever possible because it does prevent uh, early range of motion and uh, PIP uh, joint is especially unforgiving when it comes to stiffness. So I try to fix them in a stable enough position to allow early range of motion uh, whenever possible. Now we're gonna move on to uh, P-Lung fractures. This is just what you would suspect, a similar with uh, P-Lung in the ankle. Uh, there is both a dorsal and a volar component, and there is usually a high degree of comminution, which is difficult uh, to treat because you really don't have anything to build off of. For example, the hemi hemi that we described with the dorsal fracture dislocation, fracture dislocation requires a proper dorsal cortex to build off of. In this case, you really don't have much to go by. So, you know, there's a variety of different ways to treat this, but uh, one of the most popular way, and in my hands, I think has had the best results is uh, the dynamic X-fix uh, showing the upper right-hand side here. And uh, these are very difficult to construct. And if you try to go both volar and dorsal, sometimes that postoperatively there'll be significant edema and that actually will hurt your ability to start early range of motion. And uh, with the amount of comminution, depending on how bad the injury is, sometimes it's also, the screw fixation is also not very strong and the comminution is too extreme. And um, so um, these can sometimes also masquerade as well uh, in other flavors in that sometimes a fracture may seem like a dorsal fracture dislocation, but upon closer scrutiny uh, of the x-ray, you can actually see there's a small break or a small fracture line extension to the dorsal cortex as well. So in that case, uh, you want to make sure you recognize that in the pre-op x-ray and uh, devise a fixation strategy accordingly uh, that will help you uh, allow stable early range of motion. And lastly, I'll mention there's also some report, especially in the picture you see in the lower right-hand corner here. Uh, there's also been reports of some success using a pediatric mandibular distractor to allow our early motion for this type of fracture. Um, I will uh, finish off with uh, proximal phalanx fracture. And uh, so proximal phalanx fracture, you can see there's a couple of different flavors. There's unicondylar, there's comminuted, there's bicondylar. I'll mention this just briefly because Dr. Ree's case is gonna go into this a little more. But suffice it to say, the most common uh, fracture uh, pattern is apex roller. And that's because of the deforming forces. As you can see in this picture right here, the proximal fragment is flexed by the interossei and the distal fragment is pulled by the central, central slip. So that's the most common pattern. And not too surprisingly, this will cause dysfunction of both the extensor and the flexors uh, cause an imbalance and secondary compensatory deformity. So it's important to restore that length tension relationship on both sides of the finger. And um, 
you know, it's typically quoted that volar angulation and shortening, um, you know, is uh, causing the, is the cause of flexor extensor balance. And studies have shown that, um, especially if there's any level of comminution, uh, one millimeter shortening can lead to as much as 12 degrees of PIP lag, and that's going to cause significant amount of dysfunction. But if it's truly a true transverse fracture without any angulation or shortening, these can actually also be treated uh, with body tape. And of course, no male rotation can actually be treated with body tape um, with four weeks of non weight bearing and early range of motion. Although in my experience, these tend to require um, some form of surgical fixation. So non-operative criteria, no rotational deformity as we discussed, angulation shortening is important. And then uh, surgical indication is really, you know, failure of the above criteria, any unstable fracture pattern. So as far as the take-home message, um, I really split it out to two slides. Um, for intra-articular fractures, uh, especially in the hand, unlike other joints in the body, joint congruence is probably the most important because it's going to allow uh, for um, early range of motion. Articular reduction is um, secondary. And for the extra-articular fraction, it's especially important to scrutinize the exam. Uh, sometimes it will already be clearly obvious on x-ray that there's shortening, there's instability, there's angulation, but other times it may not. So you want to make sure you do a good exam to um, uh, assess for male rotation, to assess for shortening, range of motion. And then uh, uh, fixation strategy should always be designed to allow for early motion whenever possible, uh, especially around the PIP joint. That's the least forgiving as far as stiffness. And then be mindful of the soft tissue envelope because your surgical approaches and your hardware is going to have to be designed around um, these important structures. And ultimately, these uh, soft tissues and their recovery is uh, also going to play a critical role in restoring the function uh, of our patients uh, after the surgery. So, uh, and I will hand it back to Dr. Ree. Dr. Wu, thank you so much. That was, I mean, phalangeal fractures, just a PIP fracture can be a whole hour. And um, I think that was a great uh, overview of P1, P2, and P3 fractures. So I appreciate it. Um, keep, if you guys have questions, please keep asking them under the Q&A and we will uh, try to address them as we go. There's already been a lot of really, really good questions. So Here's a patient who's, uh, it's his dominant hand, had this closed injury um, playing hockey. Uh, so he has this fracture here and, and I'll just, and everyone that's listening or watching, just think about what would you do with this fracture? Would you fix it? Is it operative or non-operative? And I guess then I'll ask, uh, let's see, Jeff, I know you're on. Um, what do you think? What, what is your decision-making for a fracture like this an oblique type of fracture if you if it needs to be fixed or not yeah so uh thanks peter so looking at it especially in the lateral it does look like it's angulated so it's the the fracture is extending therefore you're going to get a, a droop at the pip so I, I think with this uh you know if it's say 15 20 degrees uh extended you're going to get uh that compensatory droop at the pip joint so i probably would think about fixing this um, I don't think there's much of a role for a closed reduction in casting. Um, you haven't mentioned rotation. Um, you know, it could certainly be rotated through this as well. So, uh, you know, we look at this image on two planes and think it's sort of a simple inclined plane, but it, it could be like a, you know, the seam of a paper towel roll and it could be a, a spiral oblique. Um, so clinical exam could, you know, show that that the, you know, the, the ring finger nail is, is, uh, pronated or supinated relative to the other fingers. So, um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd uh, probably want to fix this and, and get the guy moving. If he injured it playing hockey, he's going to want to get back to something active quickly. Yeah, no, I, I think those are very, very good points. And um, you, you've touched upon something that I'm, I'm not going to say again right now. I'll bring it up again because it's a very important learning point about the orientation of this fracture plane. Um, so if let's say, let's say this was a, this type of spiral fracture, but non, non displaced, uh, no, uh, rotational deformity. And let's say that you were going to treat this non-operatively because, uh, it seems like a stable fracture, even though it's a spiral fracture, but non-displaced, uh, 
Becky, can you can you please um, give us some perspective on for a P2 fracture, what type of splint should we ask for and what should be the type of rehab that we do? So if you're going to give me a non-operative case that looks like this, I definitely want to think about using a, um, a digit lateral digit as a support mechanism. So a buddy tape, in my opinion, is an excellent choice because you can actually strut up the um, damaged digit to the one next to it, especially if, you, if you're not, I mean, ring to long and long to index work well. The small finger gets a little tricky in these cases to actually do a good job with. And then I definitely am always thinking about that MP inflection, IPs and extension. And I think these can be really tricky because swelling will make the IP joints look extended when they're actually flexed. And I think Dr. Wu did a great job of saying, if you have uh, the PIP joint, especially is so unforgiving. So if you let that set and even a little bit of flexion, you're going to end up with a flexion contracture that's just going to become a pain in the neck. So I would definitely say a buddy tape. I'm going to try to get the, um, did the MPs flexed, IPs extended as close to zero as possible. Thanks, Becky. Do you think then um, if it was a, a non-displaced middle phalanx fracture, do you have to immobilize the MP joint or is it, or would you just do buddy tape? I mean, is it hard to get control of the fracture without going past the MP joint? So I think it's a plus minus, right? And I think it depends on your patient. If you give me a young hockey player, I might want to put him in a splint because I'm afraid if I let him use it too much, um, that we're going to end up with a bigger problem than we intend to have. I don't think if you can flex an M if you can put an MP joint in flexion, you lend yourself a good amount of motion in the long term, and so there's not a whole lot of risk to doing that in terms of stiffness um, at the end of the rehab process. Great, thank you. Well, I, I agree with Jeff, and I think uh, unless any of the faculty believe this should be treated non-op, you can even see on the X-ray he had a rotational deformity. So, this patient I counseled on on doing a, doing a reduction of some sort and fixation. Um, let's see. Chuck, what are you, what are your, Chuck, if you're able to speak, uh, what, what would be your, hey, Chuck, uh, what would be your, what would be your form of fixation for this uh, spiral fracture closed injury? I think there are really two choices. So uh, uh, I look at it as closed reduction with immobilization. So closed pinning and immobilization works, but if you open it, you must move it. So it's not an articular fracture. I think, uh, as Becky said, if you splint it properly uh, with a closed pinning, uh, you can immobilize that for a few weeks and the, the patients won't lose motion as long as their PIP joint is uh, in, immobilized in full extension. So for me, closed reduction and percutaneous pinning or open, and it could be limited open reduction with screw fixation and early motion. Great. No, I, I think uh, I share the same thought with you. I try to pin these if, if possible, just to preserve the biology and exactly what you said to limit the um, almost inevitable tendon adhesions with any type of open procedure. Now, if, if you are going to, oh yeah, sorry. Can I just make a, 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 a couple of points? Just, um, it's a, an analogous to a distal tibia spiral fracture. Uh, these fractures may be more complex than they look. So they, they can end up, uh, spiraling around like the toilet paper roll uh, that Jeff alluded to and end up in the joint. Uh, or you can have a butterfly fragment that uh, is not so clear to see. So really look closely at the, uh, at, the rec at the x-rays before you decide how to undertake this. And look at the fracture plane in the operating room. You can look and see exactly where that fracture plane is to know where the K wires are. Um, and just a couple of points for me, I like to put a percutaneous clamp at the level of the condyles of the head of the proximal phalanx uh, to get some control, more direct control of that segment. You can apply traction and rotate it and then percutaneously place a clamp across the fracture itself. So that combination of moves helps a lot. Um, and then I, I tell the uh, fellows in residents, always put in one more K-wire than you think, because at least one of them is not going to be in the right spot. Yep, and I think that's a very salient point. Um, words of wisdom, always from Chuck. The, uh, if you are going to fix this, then let's say either percutaneous pinning or open, um, what type of anesthesia would you do? There was actually a question about that. Um, how about uh, Marco, if, if you're able to, um, what, what would be your preference of anesthesia type? 
Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. You know, I think um, I would do a digital blog. You know, I, I don't think I would have to do a uh, general or anything too aggressive uh, from an anesthesia perspective. I mean, um, to me, that would work pretty well. I, I hadn't seen the fracture, though, uh, Peter. What does it look like? Uh, here, let me see. <laughs> let me see if I can go back with that. Uh... But as, I, as, I'm listening, <laughs> as I'm listening to Chuck, I thought it was a proximal phalanx fracture that was uh, spiral. And the nice thing about doing it under local is that you can reduce it and then even have the patient move um, and see that the cascade and the rotation is appropriate. Yeah, and I'm actually just curious, Marco. I, I think uh, I agree with you that I would probably do this under a digital block. Um, uh, I'm just curious with the faculty. Would you? Would any of you guys do these in your in your clinic uh, under wide awake or or in like your minor procedure room wide awake? Do any of you guys have experience with that? Kind of tough to do an open ended question with 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 uh, all the faculty. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done that. I mean, we we do have a procedure room. Um, we're probably not uh, that well equipped to be able to do fracture fixation. And you know, the problem is, as Chuck said, you know, maybe you could do this closed with some pinning, but you have to be ready to you know open it. And then if you're going to open it, you got to put screws in it because you want going to want to get them moving. So um, th this would require a pretty well outfitted procedure room that we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, I was going to say the same. We'll always have a plan B. And if plan B is more extensive, then maybe that procedure room is not the ideal place for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think if you're going and saying, I'm just going to pin it, and then um, the uh, things go haywire uh, or go south quick, yeah, you want to be prepared. And certainly if you're doing it in your clinic, um, you just want to be prepared for that. I typically like to do these... Um, not that you have to do them with epi for uh, close reduction, but um, I put this in here just because I like to do my blocks uh, this way with my, um, with uh, if I am going to do wide awake and I have to do some sort of approach, whether it's volar or, or dorsal, certainly for your PIP fracture dislocation, if you're going to shock them, then I like to do it this way. But there, like Dr. Rizzo said, there is a benefit to having them, you know, pseudo awake or, fully awake so you can assess their fracture stability and that gives you a little confidence to know that your fixation is strong enough for the rehab. Um, for the interest of time, I'm just going to move on here. So Dr. Uh, Cassidy talked about the reduction maneuver, which I think um, was, was perfect. Only thing I'll just say is this is what you want to do. It's kind of the reality versus like what you want to do or yeah. And um, if you use a perforating towel clamp, which was what most people do, those are ratcheting. Um, and so be careful because you may not, if you try to ratchet to hold it down, you may just shatter that bone. If you have a bone reducing forcep with, that's a spin down, it's probably a better one or a bigger tenaculum. But reduction, um, you know, closed, uh, the methods that Dr. Cassidy mentioned, I think is, is very good. So this is what I did in my minor procedure room, uh, like a true minor procedure room in clinic. Um, so how about, uh, Nick, if you're available, um, can you just critique this? I know the lateral is kind of hard to see, but, but rest assured the lateral, it looked, it looked like everything was aligned. Yeah, I think it, uh, well, it looks great, Peter. And, uh, obviously the benefit here, you didn't have to make an incision, um, you were able to do this closed. I'm assuming you got pins in there. You can start moving them. Uh, you know, one thing Cha mentioned with the external fixator distractor, um, it's not that they can just move it. I mean, they do have K wires next to their small finger. So, um, but I think it looks, it looks good. Okay. All right. Peter. Well, yeah. Yes. Uh, make a comment here. Yeah, please. You know, you mentioned Volant. And I think one of the things you have to think about if the fracture is slightly old is uh, how you will overcome the intrinsics, especially when you're doing the reduction maneuver with Volant. So you have to, using Volant is a great idea and a great tool, but it has to be nuanced understanding of the technique. Right? Absolutely. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. The other thing is when you do this perk pinning, um, you know, you're relying on your topographic landmark and palpation. And if you, 
do a digital block, let's say, or a tendon sheet block, it can really cause the finger to swell and, and you may lose a little bit of uh, perception of that. Jeff, give me some, give me some brutal critique on this. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, it looks good, Peter. I, I was just going to say one point. Um, if you're doing something like this, I'll actually um, drill this, uh, for example, so you got two K wires in it, you're going across. Uh, drill them live and, and actually cor correlate what you see on fluoro, meaning you're going through one cortex, going through another cortex, because it's very easy. You can imagine that proximal pin may or may not even be grabbing that distal segment. In, in other words, I can't see on your lateral. Uh, and it's very easy for that pin to capture your proximal segment and then overlie your distal segment, but not engage it. And then what you find out two weeks later is you have one pin in that fracture um, and it's right back to where you started. Um, Cause I've, I, I've seen that with K wires. I've seen that with screws. Uh, so just make sure that the, the pins are engaging or the screws are engaging what you think they're engaging. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Great point. Great point. There, there yeah, that, that's yeah. a, that was the reason why I said one more pin than you think you need. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Can I, can I make just one other point? And that is that well, lot, um, obviously we're like rats when it comes to uh, recent past, past experience, but I was, uh, I, I took care of a patient who's, who had a trigger finger release uh, under Wallant and lost the tips of two fingers uh, ne uh, from necrosis. And uh, I, it's very rare, I understand, but uh, take a look at the finger. If it's, you know, if it's a badly traumatized finger, I would not be doing that technique. Um, if the circumstances are ideal, I think you could consider it, but just keep that in mind. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think it's, it, it can't be applied to everyone. Just in, Peter, in one more thing. Exactly yes. what Chuck said. This is a torsional injury. And if it's a high, high energy torsional injury, be very careful about injecting more stuff. And the second thing is uh, commonly, uh, a technique that I used many years ago, but which is not used more and which can be utilized is using a Babcock forceps. A Babcock forceps is what we used to use to do appendectomies. And uh, it has a central uh, hole, which is quite sizable. And it uh, provides, it, it's a very wide zone of compression. So it compresses across a very long uh, portion of the fracture, leaving you a central hole through which you can see the reduction. And you can pin through the central hole. And then all you have to do is cut the wire and take the forceps off. And uh, it, it's a good thing to remember in the back of your mind. They come in three sizes. So that, that's, that's a great, uh, great pearl. Uh, it's uh, Babcock, Babcock. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call for that next time, Chai. Appendectomies. Appendectomies, <laughs> yes. Uh, so Becky, let's say we, we fix it this way and, um, now I'm sending them to you for early mobilization. Any thoughts on like, um, what, what they should be focusing on, what they should be doing in, in terms of their early rehab? Yeah, so at the, risk of, at the risk of stating the obvious, we know that the FDP crosses the proximal phalanx and is closest to the bone, but it's also going to extend all the way to the distal phalanx. And so the idea that you can create FDP glide at least past the fracture site with DIP motion can't be understated. And the patient is a lot more comfortable typically to do DIP motion because that joint is far enough away from the fracture site that it's a comfortable motion for them, right, exactly. And so it's a great place to block. And um, we also could leave it out of the immobilization and let them do that throughout the day. The other thing that I think therapists miss pretty often is the importance of gliding the extensor mechanism and really trying to engage the central slip past the um, PIP joint because that extensor lag can really happen if that extensor mechanism gets scarred down to the fracture site as well. And so I think therapists tend to really focus on flexion, but extension can be just as important and really trying to extend and flex. The final thing I'll say is to remember that short arc motion is an option. And so tendon glide doesn't have to be full or complete. And so I like the idea of even short arc motion for patients who can't tolerate full motion in the early phase. Um, thinking about that MP joint inflection, trying to really get those IPs to full extension um, and really glide the mechanism and the FDP. Great, that's, that's an important point because I feel like for a lot of surgeons, we think that we need to do this for full tendon excursion. But as we know from our flexor tendon uh, literature that like you said, it, it just needs 
um, a little bit of excursion to prevent that adhesion. Uh, Becky, yeah, I was just Peter. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Ask again. Um, oh, go ahead, Marco. Sorry, man. Uh, talk me through your decision. Um, do, do you like? You clearly decided not to bury the pins in this place. Are there patients that you bury pins on, or or do you just routinely leave them out to scan? Oh, that's a good topic. Uh, I I leave them out, and my decision point is. If it's going to be six weeks or less, I leave them out just so I don't have to take them back to the OR, unless it's a patient that I'm really concerned they're going to have pin track issues. But for most, like I think a phalangeal fracture that I leave closed, I think that will probably clinically heal by about four, four to six weeks. And so I'll leave them out. How about, how about you, Marco? Do you leave, would you leave these transverse pins buried or? Oh yeah, I don't, I don't feel like you need to go to the OR to take them out. You can do a digital block and and it, it, it depends. It depends on how it affects their re rehab in some ways. I find that they rehab a little bit more confidently when they don't have pins that they're looking at. And to me, it also, you know, allows me the opportunity to leave the pins in maybe a little longer than I otherwise would. They're less likely to be, get soupy or red. Uh, again, it's annoying to the patient because they can feel them under the skin, but, you know, I can take them on the clinic with just a little local and, and a 15 blade. Yeah, yeah, I, 11, I, 11 blade, I mean, sorry. yeah, I think I think it's definitely dealer's choice on what you want to do. There's definitely pros and cons with with either. Um, sorry to uh, interrupt. No, no, not at all. Um, right. Becky, do you have any experience with the pain based uh, protocol that's popularized by uh, uh, the St. John's Hospital in uh, New Brunswick, by chance? Um, I, now, you know, Do Dr. Lalonde is a big advocate of um, wide awake hand surgery and um, his institution, they, they, they uh, utilize essentially a pain-based protocol where patient can't take narcotics and you do essentially what you said, Becky, it's just short arc motion and a orthosis protect it. And the, the benefit they say is, um, you know, you get patients moving early, but to facilitate that, you do the, the surgery with them somewhat awake so you can just test their stability in the OR. Have you, do you have any experience with that, Becky? Unfortunately, I don't. And I highly respect, you know, both Dr. Lalonde and Amanda Higgins, his therapist. And, you know, she's typically in the OR with him. So there's a great opportunity oh. to create rapport with the, with the uh, patients in the OR because she's the one guiding and talking to them a lot of the time while Dr. Lalonde is doing the surgery. So it's an amazing team opportunity, right, for the yeah. therapist to be working with the patient right there. I think the challenge with pain always is that for you, pain might be very different than it is for me. And for me to always, as the therapist, absolutely respect the idea that some patients tolerate things much, much more effectively than others. And we just have to be really, really careful. Pain, I, th I think if we can get the patient moving early and they trust us, they trust us that movement is not gonna cause more pain that actually will decrease the pain, that's going to be incredibly helpful because the longer the they wait to start, in my opinion, the harder and more painful it will be. Yeah, thank you for your perspective on that. I think you've made a good point. I think especially with fracture work and tendon work, all the hand surgeons out there, please find your therapist, be friends with them, make a partnership because I tell patients, you know, surgery is 10% of it, but your relationship with the therapist and the patient effort, that's like 90% of the um, their recovery. Thank you, Becky. Now, as I just kind of chuckled as Jeff was saying, uh, and Chuck, because that's exactly right. You know, these are spiral type fractures and what, what seems like you're, and these pins are typically going mid-axial to mid-axial. You know, you're not really going in a crazy orientation. So by definition, at some point for a spiral fracture, you'll probably miss some fixation. And this, and I, I feel like in this patient, that's probably, that is what happened. And I, he was reliable, did early range of motion, but I think that it just wasn't, Actually, Jeff, you nailed it. It's it's uh, and Chuck. It's just that pin, which seemed like it was stable, was not. And so this was very early on in my career, and I this was my aha moment that gosh, of course, like it's a spiral fracture. I gotta, uh, like Chuck said, I usually try to put at least three pins in if possible, even if I have to drop it to a three five pin. These are four or five pins, um, just so I know that in that mid axial orientation, I'm at least grabbing four cortices. Any thoughts? From the faculty, you know, Peter, 
uh, for the audience, it might be useful to let them know that you use 1.1 millimeter pins for those of them who are not used to the measurement devices that we use. Hmm. Got it. Thank you. I actually didn't know that, Chai. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so now if you're dealing with this now, um, now what would you do? So how would you, this is a week out. So I saw him back a week after the pinning in my clinic. And now I said, well, look, man, you lost your reduction. We're going to have to do something else. Um, would anyone try to repin this? Jeff, would you repin this? Or would you say, you know what, we're going to go, it's, it's now like two weeks old. You're going to go and revise it with the plate. Um, so I'd certainly take out the pins and see if I could reduce it. And if I could percutaneously reduce it, um, I probably would have been more inclined to put two or three screws in it percutaneously than, than pins, but you know, it's sort of potato, potato, uh, you know, but it's, it's, I think your ability to get a reduction because, you know, as I sort of said, and, and, uh, you know, and I, and I've seen this occur. I mean, I didn't see this case, but, um, you know, it's sort of back where it was, meaning it's, it's, it's rotated and it's, and it's extended. So, uh, you know, now at a week and a half, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get that closed. Um, so if you can't get it closed, then you got to do it open. Um, and then if you talk about open, um, you know, there, there's sort of problems going lateral, there's problems going dorsal. It, it's which of those problems do you want to deal with uh, and where you think you're going to get your fixation. Now that you mentioned that, Jeff, if you did, if you were going to plate it and get open reduction, what do you choose then? Do you do a, a dorsal approach, lateral mid-axial, like a yeah. lateral approach? So, I mean, I think for this fracture, um, what I would probably do is I would probably go dorsal, split the extensor tendon, um, and then still, it's a long oblique fracture. I'd still probably put two or three screws in it and, and probably wouldn't plate it. Okay. Um, would any, any of the faculty do a mid-axial approach for this? Yeah, Nick, I, I think I would. Uh, you could do it uh, through a limited incision. You have to pick, if you're going to do it that way, which side you want to see. You want to see the distal end or the proximal end? Um, yeah. or, or both the most extensile is what Jeff ha had mentioned. Um, and any of them can result in extensor tendon adhesions. So. Uh, pick your poison, I guess, uh, but you, you've illustrated the uh, mid mid axial approach. I think I think the advantage of, I think the advantage of going dorsal is that you can get a better exposure overall. You can work around the lateral bands. You can split the extensor, so you have access to the three dimensionality of the fracture better than if you went just straight lateral. And I would have I would echo what Jeff did. I, I would or what Jeff suggested. I would go dorsal. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're. I think that's right. With a two-week-old, can't remember two or three-week-old fracture now. Um, I think that you could do either dealer's choice, but the dorsal to me seemed like a better option here, so I could really clear everything out and take a look at it. But I just wanted to put this in for the uh, participants, so you just knew that know that the two common approaches are the mid-axial, which can still get you dorsal really nicely, and even volar if you wanted to. That mid-axial takes you dorsal to your neurovascular bundle, so you'd have to go through Cleland's and Grayson's to get Palmer, but you certainly can do this. And this is in the AO um, surgery reference if you want to take a look. Now, if you have difficulty getting full exposure, as you would imagine, from your lateral bands, you, you certainly can resect some of that lateral band on that side, or you can just um, uh, split that and then do your approach and fix everything and then repair it back down. I think if, if you're going to do that, I just cut out a band because it'll inevitably scar. Um, and then if you want to do a dorsal approach, that's certainly more extensile, but you get a unparalleled view of the entire uh, P1. If this is a, uh, if this was a P1, you know, fracture. Okay. And then the post-op rehab, um, I think Becky has already outlined uh, really nicely. And here he was uh, six weeks out, yeah, six weeks out from his revision. And you can see I went dorsal and I even put that um, uh, inner frag uh, screw across there. Do you guys have any thoughts? I, you know, like this was a great learning case for me because 
uh, you know, like I up until this time, you know, in fellowship, I really hadn't pinned very many fractures. And this is my first year in practice. And I had gotten away with doing just two pins on these spiral fractures. And this one was the first one that kind of hit me in the face and made me realize, A, the, the fracture, a spiral fracture pattern, it's, it's, um, it's, it can be this, it can be deceiving. So you want to be sure that you have stable fixation and then um, uh, getting them moving early. And he, despite all this, his, his function was pretty good, but mainly because he was so motivated. Any, any words of wisdom additional from the faculty? I would just say um, we're all gentlemanly. There was a gap, you know, uh, at the first post-op x-rays, which is a little concerning in that, uh, as you know, uh, radiographic healing lags behind clinical healing. And it, if, if already it's gapped, uh, it's a little it's a little worrisome in terms of, you know, you had talked about the six weeks. Uh, that's not going to, even if it didn't move, it's not going to, it won't even look healed by six weeks if it's gapped like that. Uh, the second point is if you could go backwards just for one, I kind of look at it uh, from the stable back to the uh, the displaced, right? Uh, the displaced uh, uh, fracture with the pins in it. Okay, that, that's good. Uh, so if you have a fr fracture reduction clamp, I, I kind of look at it as what's your stable and unstable segment? So the proximal portion of the proximal phalanx is relatively stable. And as you're driving those K wires across, it is pushing that distal segment away. Uh, and your clamp is, is resisting it, um, but it may not be entirely effective. That could cause that to distract. So ideally, you'd want to put, I would want to put it from in the other direction to push it in because that proximal segment is not going to be as freely mobile as the distal segment. Uh, the other is I, I like to put one clamp, exactly what you had described, but one clamp in the middle. Um, and then once I like it, it's perfectly reduced. I will put clamps on either end, take the clamp off in the middle so that I know that it's locked in on both ends. And then I don't care if I'm going percutaneously, if I go through the extensor mechanism dorsally, it just, it ha they have to be perpendicular to the fracture. And some of them, uh, as it spirals around, you're not gonna be able to, uh, to limit yourself to the mid-axial plane if you do it that way, which is fine. Um, so I just go right through the extensor mechanism if necessary and, um, and uh, make sure that I hold the, the PIP joint in full extension when I do it. So I don't tether the extensor mechanism in, in a flex position. Yeah, uh, those, those are great insights. And, and uh, the that technique you described, Chuck, is exactly what I do is the bone reducing forcep in the middle, pin, pin, take it out and then pin in the middle. And uh, you brought up uh, phalangeal fractures 2.0, which would have been uh, exactly what you said. If you're pushing against that unstable frag fragment, it can displace it. So if I feel like I need to go in to the opposite direction from the opposite direction, I'll just actually pull, I'll uh, retrograde it through back, if that makes sense, to try to get yeah. some compulsion. Um, th those are all really, really good points. Peter, uh, can I ask can I ask one question? Um, do you yes. think it's possible that you got the reduction right, and then once he started moving, the pin started to back out? Possibly. You know, you know me, Marco. I love I love to blame the patient. So, um, <laughs> uh, when I know, look I, when I look at that X-ray one week later, it looks like the pins are backed out a bit almost. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's the obliquity of the X-rays or. No, I think you're right. I think in retrospect. Uh, I think I only had three choruses and then we started moving them early and then it started to uh, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle and then back the other pin out that was probably bicortical and then uh, and it looked like that. So the... Um, Peter. Get, yes, yes. When you have a reasonable fixation, even if it is with two pins, um, what is the urgency to move the PIP? As long as you move the DIP with blocking and getting gliding, differential glide between the FDS and the FDP, it almost seems a little uh, brave to try and move the PIP, isn't it? Well, I guess uh, we'll ask Becky. Um, I feel like anytime you know you fix a P1 or a, a P2 fracture, it, almost inevitably they get some sort of loss of either terminal flexion in their PIP, they get some sort of flexion contracture to some degree. 
Becky, what are your thoughts? Because I, I, Chai's point is well taken. And for tendon excursion, I'm talking about more intrinsic joint contracture and flexion or, or extension. So, yeah. So we know the PIP joint is closed, packed, and extension. So as long as my patient is really well, well immobilized with the PIP and extension, I'm not as worried about joint and maintaining the length of the collateral ligaments. What I'm most concerned about and why I want to do a little, at least a little bit, and I can even take, you can give me 20 or 30 degrees in a short arc motion protocol. I want to engage the central slip and I want to make sure that that is gliding, the mechanism is gliding and I'm getting pulled through the central slip to create PIP extension. I think that's what you lose if you don't do a, at least a little bit of range of motion. And I don't need full range, but I think this point can't, we have to say this out loud. If we're worried about motion and we immobilize people, it's harder to get it back later. And those flexion contractures and some of the other kind of sequelae that come from not moving are worse than moving in the first place. So I wouldn't want the participants to think that motion caused the pins to back out. Maybe it's just that it was too much motion or too aggressive of motion. So it's not a yes, no. Um, it's kind of a, how do we modulate or how do we find the good middle ground? Yeah, no. I also, think you have to understand why you're doing the motion. You're doing the motion to avoid two things, PIP flexion contractures or PIP stiffness and flexit in adhesions. And it has to be a judicious line that you walk where you're deciding. So, you know, differential glide phenomenon is good for me, but uh, your point is well taken about PIP flexion contractures. The way I see it is if I, if I had a patient with a PIP flexion contracture, I can put up with it. But if I have a patient with a failed fixation, that's a bigger problem, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I feel like uh, kind of the recap of that case is I don't think that I had stable fixation, which was the main problem. Like, like Becky said, I don't yeah. want anyone to think that early range of motion is, is a bad thing in the right patient that's, that's done with you know, decent supervision and um, just, just vigilant about any complication. I think that's, I think that's um, quite helpful. Uh, now, can, can I make one point? One point. Uh, yes. Sorry. But this is really important, and that is uh, it, the dressing is an afterthought. You know, you feel like, oh man, I did a great job. I put these pins in, and and then you put some dressings around the pins, and then it gets bulkier and bulkier, and it's very difficult to know whether the PIP joint is in full extension. And I think, as you know, as Chai alluded to, I think it's fine to immobilize these uh, short term, and as long as they're in full extension. If you haven't opened it, if you haven't opened it, they'll be okay. But if you immobilize them in a little bit of flexion, they're going to have a problem. So you have to be really uh, uh, fastidious. And the other point was, uh, we always like to show our best cases. And I think this was a very illustrative case. And I give you a lot of credit for, for showing it. This was actually your case, Chuck. You gave us, the, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, it's, I think, um, I, hopefully I learned from it. It was a very defining moment in my uh, early career in managing these type of fractures with close pinning. And so hopefully you guys can learn from me. Uh, so the take home points from the case. Uh, all of us have this case. Yeah, I know. And that's all why I think everyone, yeah, everyone has knew this is probably coming. Yes, um, all of us have this case. Have good indications for fixing these fractures. Know your patients for sure. Who would be a good patient for early range of motion and not have stable fixation. So then you can allow them to get some early range of motion. Um, we have still a lot in store coming up, so please continue to, we have 129 people, awesome, thank you, um, joining us and um, continue to join us um, weekly uh, for this. Um, you can access these recordings through YouTube, through the AO North America uh, channel, so just wait for that to come out in the next 24 hours. And then uh, for all the participants, please hang on. We will shortly get um, uh, some questions for you that you'll have to answer to get your CME credit. Thank you to all of our faculty. Cha, Dr. Wu, thank you very much for that excellent presentation and to the faculty that uh, gave us some great perspective. Thank you very much. Everyone be safe, have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>